Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Heidi Abrush. She is a PhD candidate here in Ecology and Evolution at the University of Montana. She's in her fourth year and researching the relationship between diatoms and cyanobacterial endosymbionts. Lots of words that we will all learn about. Um, Heidi's been in Montana for seven years and loves all things algae and microscopic, which warms my heart. And without further ado, take it away, Heidi. Thank you. It's all it goes. Yeah. I think you have my whole slide, though. It's not cut off, but it does look it looks odd. I'll give you that. Uh, hi. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, a little small group. Hopefully, everybody can hear me on Zoom. Warn me if I start to stray, please, <laughs> from the mic. Um, so I'm a fourth year student here. I did not intend to start working on diatoms. I kind of fell into this, but I love them. I love all things like she said, microscopic. Um, I love this like whole extra world that is like hidden from us in rivers and streams. I have to click the PowerPoint this time. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been here in Montana. I finished my undergrad at University of Montana. Uh, I worked in Scott's lab the whole time. Scott Miller is here. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, where I was actually researching a type of cyanobacteria, but when I started to look to grad school, I shifted to start working on diatoms, which are these really cool algae. Um, but generally, this is like my favorite photo I've ever found online because <laughs> I think it describes me to a T. I'm very stubborn traditionally. Diatoms are not the easiest to grow in lab and study. But I love it. It's a challenge every single day. Um, and the other thing that I've really uh, grown very fond of is this idea of endosymbiosis, where some organism lives inside of another organism, typically some sort of cyanobacteria. And getting into like microscopy and photography and sharing that kind of as an art form. So this is a hydra that has a green algal endosymbionts that photosynthesize for it. And so I want to start with like, what is algae? Um, it's this term that kind of gets thrown around a lot. Essentially, it's just things that photosynthesize but are not plants. So that can be anything, lots of things that aren't related. We categorize them by color a lot. I don't have a pointer. There, I can do the mouse. So we've got like golden algae. Um, you might be familiar with some of this like filamentous green algae that grows in rivers, red algae, kelp. All these things aren't plants, but they perform a very similar function. And we're talking about diatoms, which is this one little group often called golden brown algae. And so what is a diatom? Diatoms are these single celled algae that live in glass houses. So they literally make cell walls out of silica, same material that builds glass. And they leave behind these super intricate detailed uh, cell walls when they die. And I thought for a really long time about what my thesis, what my big take home message was <laughs> and for this talk. And basically I came up with diatoms are cool. This is like, they're everywhere. They're so important. I'm going to go through all of these different uses and you'll start to see that they pop up in all these different places. But really, if I could just convince everybody of this one thing, I would be thrilled. Um, and so I'm going to do that by going through some of their history, both like culturally and evolutionarily. I want to talk about the diversity of this group, just how like many species there are and how many shapes and how many different functions they perform about their ecology and their importance both like environmentally, but also industrially and medically and all these other things. And then I'm gonna sprinkle in some highlights about diatoms in Montana specifically towards the end. So diatoms, the history of us knowing about diatoms goes really, really far back. Um, this photo here is of a drawing from 1703. So basically we developed the technology of microscopes and immediately started noticing these really funny geometric shapes. Um, and so this date looks back to, I think the late 1800s, this is Atlas of Diatoms. 
and it's continually updated even to this day. And there's just all of these interesting, like if you looked through a microscope and saw this shape, like that doesn't feel like an animal. It doesn't feel like a plant. It doesn't feel like anything. Even like amoebas have this very like flowy shape. Diatoms do not. And they very quickly became really popular actually in art. And so they're often known as jewels of the sea for pretty obvious reasons. And in the Victorian era, microscopes became more popular and people actually started making these really beautiful diatom arrangements. Uh, this art form peaked in the Victorian era, unfortunately. So there's not a lot of people that do this to this day. There's one man who's known for it. His name is Klaus Kemp. And there's a National Geographic mini documentary that talks about this. That's really interesting if you just search for National Geographic diatoms, it shows up. Uh, but these are made under a microscope, literally using a single hair to push these cells around into these forms that they preserve forever on slides. So that's a bit of our like cultural history of diatoms. But what are diatoms like? Where do they come from? Who are they related to? I'm really interested in evolution and genetics and that side of biology. And so this is just kind of a hodgepodge tree showing you a bunch of different eukaryotes. So there's animals and fungi on here. We also have lots of plants. We can see land plants. They're related to the green algae. We also have red algae over here. But diatoms and kelp are, I guess I should use my pointer more. Diatoms and kelp are up here in this corner, not really next to any of the other photosynthetic things. Um, diatoms and kelp are actually like very closely related to one another, even though they look, kelp is very plant-like. Uh, I would not fault anybody for thinking kelp is a plant, it is not. Um, and so what actually happened is long, long time ago, uh, diatoms formed this endosymbiotic relationship with red algae. So a single cell red algae was engulfed by some bacteria or some other uh, heterocrant single celled protist. It ate this red algae and instead of digesting it and using that for food, it kept it around to use for photosynthesis power. And now they have food from carbon dioxide and light. You might be familiar with this in the case of plant chloroplasts. So they come from a photosynthetic algae that was originally a eukaryote that engulfed a cyanobacteria. And so that evolved into green algae, which also evolved and diversified and formed plants. Something really similar happened with the red algae. And so this history of endosymbiosis is really complicated. This is like the most simplified diagram I could find. But essentially we have, instead of a bacteria that turns into the chloroplast, we have a eukaryote that turns into a chloroplast. And so this is where we get this really classic golden brown color of diatoms and similar with kelp, which is also this brown gold color where their chloroplasts don't look green like you would think. They look this very pretty gold color. Um, and in terms of when this happened, this is a history of basically from the start of the earth until now. Most of this is we have a little bit of photosynthesis from cyanobacteria and we start to get eukaryotes here. So we first start getting organelles and mitochondria and then stuff really starts happening here. So if we look at these, or these most recent, like 500 million years or so, we can see that we get land plants start to pop up, uh, as well as I meant to put in uh, like flower plants and things on here for you. I don't know if we live on the top of our head. Uh, but then if we look at these last 200 million years, that's when diatoms start to pop up. And so they're really not that old of a group if you think about it in terms of all of these other groups we think about. And the 200-ish is kind of the oldest estimate of these diatoms arising, but really they've come up a lot more recently, about 100 to 50 million years ago, where they had this really big boom in diversification. And from that, they've gone crazy with diversification. We have Tons and tons of species. They've been called the beetles of the protist world. If you're familiar, beetles have 
hundreds of thousands of species, so many species. Um, and diatoms have done something very similar in a much smaller amount of time. And so there's been estimates anywhere from like 20,000 to over 200,000 species of diatoms. And a lot of this is just based on morphological, like what they look like. But as we've developed genetic technologies, we've also been able to find this like cryptic diversity that is separating things that we can't tell apart visually. However, diatoms have basically retained the same structure at its like very core. So this glass cell wall that I mentioned is called a frustule. Um, and they all share the same structure that's essentially a Petri dish. We've just squished and stretched and moved it in different directions. So those two halves fit together like a Petri dish. One fits slightly inside the other. And then those are bound together by these things called girdle bands. And so we end up with these two different ways. We look at diatoms, this valve view, and this girdle view where they might look a little different, but it's the same species. You're just viewing them at, from like the face of the petri dish versus the side. And then from there, we've kind of classified them further into these two different groups, basically based on symmetry. So we have centric diatoms, which are some sort of radial symmetry. And then pennate diatoms come up with, I've heard like 20 different shape descriptions. I call it hot dog shaped, uh, but some sort of bilateral symmetry where they share two sides instead of some circle. And so the other thing is centrics do not always look like circles if you see them from the side. So a lot of this depends on just how they lay on a surface. So if you have something really big, but it's not very wide, it's gonna lay flat. And you get this really nice, big, pretty circle like this Cascanodiscus. But we also get centric diatoms that form these really long chains like Melosyra, which is a really common diatom that I see in Montana samples a lot. They grow on rocks and they form these just massive, beautiful golden chains um, versus something that is pennate, will always look pennate. Uh, and then this is further broken down into nine different morphological groups. I'm not going to go into each one of these specifically, but this is to just give you an idea of like all of these different diversities we see just based on that shape that they make, just the outline almost. And so I have to show off centric diatom diversity because I don't get to see them a lot. They're much more common in marine ecosystems, so they're out in the ocean. So we do get some diatoms like this. We do get some centric diatoms that look like circles, but we don't get ones like my favorite genus, I think ever, which is this star shape called Hydrocera. This is just like absolutely boggles my mind that I could look under a microscope one day and see a literal star just there. That's just the shape they make. And they make lots of different centric shapes. We have this nice uh, like radio, uh, what do I think it's hazardous symbol. Um, these long pointy ones are also circles. They're just stretched out really, really far. And then pennate diatoms have really taken over. So that morphology of nine different groups I showed you, just one of those is centrics, even though they're super diverse. And pennate diatoms have just taken over. So we have this in two different categories. We have these araphids, and they're very similar to centrics and like they are usually living in the open water column. They're planktonic. They don't do lots of moving around or anything. Versus raphid diatoms all have this rafe structure. This is split into their glass cells. And the purpose of that is essentially to move around. So this is a diatom that I took a video of this summer because it's so big, it's really nice to show. So you can see I'm focusing through these different planes of focus and you can see those rafe slits. And then in real time, this is what it lets them do. So they're able to glide around, this is how fast they go in real life. Um, they're able to move around, find nutrients, find a better habitat for themselves. And then some diatoms have also, let's we'll see if this works, this is an embedded YouTube video. <laughs> some diatoms have been able to, Okay. Some diatoms have worked together, so they use this mobility 
to move around in this colonial form. So this is Basilaria, they're super pretty to see. And it's every individual diatom is just gliding along each other at a much slower speed, but they're able to create this very large, almost macro scale movement. There we go. And then not all diatoms fit into these categories. It's biology, nothing fits neatly into a box the way we would like. And so one of the more important ones, especially here in Montana, is a species called Caponius. And this is a monoraphid diatom, which means that the two sides of the Petri dish are not the same at all. Uh, so this really confused biologists for a long time because typically you are not taking your single cell, flipping it over, seeing what it looks like on the other side. And so each side that you might see of the same species looks totally different. Uh, and so these typically are epiphytic. They live on plants, on any sort of filamentous surface. Um, these are pretty much any like plant you take out of the water and look at, you're gonna find some cochineus on it. And then we also have these really pretty Eunotia diatoms that I also don't get to see that often, but they're really pretty and they're kind of this like halfway step in between what we think of as diatoms with no rafe, diatoms with a rafe. Um, and they live primarily in these really acidic habitats. And so I study things that live in alkaline habitats, so I don't get to see them a lot, but they're super pretty. Um, what's going on? And then at the even smaller scales, this is all like just the shape of the thrust rule. Like what is the outline of it? They get really intricate, even at like single micron scale. And so this is, if you think about living inside of a glass house, you still need to get things in and out. And so diatoms have all of these different intricate little tiny structures and pores to allow nutrients to go in and out, waste to go in and out. And if you're not used to thinking about things at like a micron level, this is the average size of an E. coli. And so these are like, tiny, tiny holes, but they're really consistent within a species. And so they're really helpful when we're identifying species or describing something new. The other interesting thing about this is it's been hypothesized that this is also a defense for the diatoms. Not only the glass house makes them harder to eat as food, it's hard to eat something covered in glass, but these like openings and things are so small that it could also be a defense against things like pathogens and viruses. So a lot of what we think of as normal virus size doesn't necessarily fit with the diatom. There are diatom viruses, but they're a lot more recently discovered. We don't know a lot about them, but it seems to be some extra layer of defense for them as well. Uh, the other thing that's hard about living in a glass house is reproducing. And so like most single cell organisms, they reproduce by dividing into two of the same thing but with a glass shell, that's really hard to do. And so what's really interesting is they, instead of keeping the same size, both halves come apart and that becomes the outside of the new cells. So one stays the same size, but that other one is slightly smaller and we end up with these size series. And so all of these species have some sort of max size, and some sort of minimum size, which seems kind of weird. How do you get back to big if you are already small? The answer to that is they also sexually reproduce. And so once these diatoms hit some minimum critical size, they have to go find a mate or produce gametes in some way and form zygotes and they form this thing called an oxospore. And you can see actually through like the parental pieces of the frustule. And so this like kind of globby diatom forms. And this can be something that happens really regularly in some populations, but it can also be something that only happens once every decade in these diatoms. So it really depends on the diatom, on the population. This is one of the only ones I've ever seen in my like five years of looking at diatoms pretty frequently. Um, so it's very exciting to see and it's, not super well understood, there are things that like trigger it, but if they don't find a mate in time, they just, that line of cells just dies out because they can't regenerate their size and they can't keep getting smaller. Um, the other really interesting thing is they form different colonies. They have lots of different ways of forming colonies. 
Um, there are two like main functions of forming these colonies. One is it helps them stay afloat. So if they're planktonic, they're floating out in the water, they're photosynthetic, they need light, so they can't just sink to the bottom of the lake or the bottom of the ocean. And so they're able to form colonies to help them stay up in where the light is. Um, they've also, you can use this to prevent predation in some way, prevent grazing. And then the other reason is to stay attached to things. So they stop forming diatoms, they form tubes. Um, this is what it might be a little hard to see, but when they form colonies, they're physically holding on to each other. This one looks like they're holding hands. It's very cute, <laughs> um, but they're forming some sort of structure that allows them to stay attached to each other beyond just like kind of sticking together. And so this shape and structure together uh, form, like inform where these diatoms live, what they're doing. So in something that's more planktonic, we see lots of colonies. They have these like long spindly arms that help them stay afloat. We see lots of centric diatoms, things that can't move around versus uh, benthic or things that are like living on the surface or on the bottom of a river. We see lots of diatoms that can move around. They can find an area with more light, something that's more favorable. Um, and we'll see colonies, but they're for like attaching to stuff. And this is where you get the like slimy rock stuff is things like this. Oh, okay. are we good? Can Zoom still see the screen? Given the computer just had a moment. I'm gonna say yes. Okay. So, what are diatoms doing in the environment, in the ecosystem? What's going on? And so, this is one of my favorite figures I found in diatom everything. They act a lot like you would think of like a forest, but at a really tiny scale, especially with benthic diatoms. We've got these different layers. And similar to forests, we think about them performing these two like chemical functions where they're making oxygen, putting oxygen out of the atmosphere and fixing that carbon. And then that carbon gets sequestered or sunk into the tree. It's no longer carbon dioxide in the air. And diatoms are doing something really similar. And diatoms are everywhere. They're everywhere there's water, everywhere you can think of. They're in moss. They're living in like desert soils. They don't get water every once in a while. They're all over the ocean and rivers. And so all of that adds up to an estimated, this is very back of the envelope calculation, but an estimated 20% of oxygen produced and about 40% of what's produced from the ocean comes from diatoms. And then 40% of carbon that's sunk in the ocean down into the depths where it can't be used anymore also comes from diatoms. They're made of glass. They sink quite well. Um, and so they're able to perform two of these really, really important functions. Um, and then the other things they perform, they're like the base. They're the things that are grazed upon, very similar to plants. Um, this is an uh, example from the San Francisco estuary, but it shows really well the, this bright red and then that top super dark blue are both diatoms compared to all of the other algae. In the whole San Francisco estuary, this is combined from lots and lots of different years, about a decade from like sampling every single month. Um, diatoms are always there. They're always super duper present. And so this is what things like insects and uh, zooplankton are grazing on. Also what fish are eating. So my favorite example of this, and if you talk to uh, other diatomists, they will tell you something very similar. You can't get fish oil without diatoms. Fish oil is diatom oil. Um, so the things that you think of, so like omega-3 fatty acids or other like fatty acids that you think of as really key for that fish taste, if you like fish, is coming from things like diatoms and a couple of other algae species. So they're really like, that's just getting eaten by the fish and concentrated into what we think of as like fish. Um, the other thing, my favorite thing, is that diatoms form beneficial relationships with other microbes. And so they form these biofilms and these like clusters of gooey gunk, which might be something annoying to you if you are walking out into the river and are slipping on wet, slippery rocks. Um, but diatoms, especially these raphid diatoms that are living on the surface of things, 
are excreting a lot of this stuff called exopolysaccharide. It's this like mucilaginous, gelatinous stuff. Bacteria really seem to like it. It seems to help both bacteria grow and it also seems to help the diatoms grow. So it is very, if you talk to anybody who's tried to grow diatoms in culture, anything, they do not want to grow without bacteria with them. Like they are not happy if they don't have other bacteria friends around them. And if you look at this like SEM electron microscope scale, you can see these bacteria on the diatom festival are like really like stuck to it. They don't just like wash away. Um, and some diatoms, and I'll talk about this more in, towards the end of the talk, but some diatoms have also brought those bacteria into their cells um, where the bacteria perform some function, usually nitrogen fixing. So they provide nitrogen from the atmosphere and gaseous nitrogen, so like ammonium or nitrate, and provides it to the host and the bacteria gets a nice little place to live. So that's kind of like, what diatoms are? Where are they? What's going on? Diatoms are like one of the most useful microbes in like terms of breadth of what industries they impact. Um, this is like not even everything at all. It's just the most organized version. Um, one of my favorite examples is they're really important in forensic science. Um, diatoms are really, really important in terms of identifying drowning victims and like other water related incidents. Um, and if you become a diatom taxonomist that is certified, you are like going to interact with the FBI, which is really interesting. Um, but it's really important for solving these like very like human scale things. But they're also really important for things like biomedical science. So diatom frustules for how intricate and like delicate and detailed they are. They're being studied as drug delivery systems now and helping drugs be like more available to the body. They are also researched for like biotechnology and merging that with like silica and computer technology and growing these really intricate detailed computer pieces. I don't know a lot about that. Please don't ask me more about that one. Um, but I wanna go through a couple of like the more common ones. The first one is diatomaceous earth. It's everywhere. It's all over. You've maybe used it if you garden or have had the misfortune of dealing with like bed bugs or any other sort of bug pest. You might have bought some diatomaceous earth. And so it comes, it literally looks like this white powder. But if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see something like this. You can even like identify where this diatomaceous earth might have come from just by looking at it. It forms these big old rocks. I'm not a geologist. I don't know a ton about it, but it's called diatomite, um, where it's just lots of diatoms have sunk down their silica so they don't break down and they get compressed into rocks. Um, we don't have a ton of it in Montana that I could find, but this is kind of like reported areas where we know that there's diatomaceous earth. There's huge diatomaceous earth mines and it's used for everything. There are now advertisements for these super absorbent bath mats that are just made out of diatomaceous earth. So they soak up water really fast. They release the water. Diatomaceous earth, because it's the silica, it's really good at absorbing water. And it's also very sharp and prickly. So it's very good against things with exoskeletons, like pests you don't want, um, because it just cuts into a little chitin. It's also used as a cement additive, kind of more industrially at this huge scale. And then most of diatomaceous earth is actually used for filtration devices. So there's, this is like a pool filtered diatomaceous earth, but think of more like the big industrial scale and like wastewater treatment and all of these other things. It's all, it's all diatoms. Um, oh. Is it cause I'm like stepping on this cord? I will try not to step on it anymore. <laughs> the other like, thinking about an industrial application is diatoms produce, I mentioned the fatty acids earlier, they make lipids like crazy, like no other organism. And so this has led to them being a really strong candidate for researching biofuels and creating some sort of fuel that we can grow at a more human time scale, um, just for this like natural ability to make as well as store lots of lipids. And then the thing that starts to get more local is diatom indices. Uh, so this is a way to monitor how an environment is doing like 
by just taking some of the water and looking what diatoms are there. So these are often created pretty locally. So like for different regions, there are a few in Montana, but they're there to detect maybe there's too much like agricultural runoff leading to an increase in nutrients. And we'll be able to see that in the water by looking at diatoms that increase under high nutrients or low nutrients, as well as things like diatoms that thrive in alkaline water, like the epithemoid diatoms, which is what I study. And then Eunosha diatoms are ones that grow in this pH below seven more acidic waters. And you can track lots of these different environmental variables. These are like the very bird's eye view version of those, but there's also like very intricate. This species is really sensitive. And so it will be tracked over time just to see what's going on in the water and the health of the ecosystem. Alongside that, there's monitoring for like mining contamination or other contaminants of like toxic metals or other toxic elements we don't want in the water. So this is a couple of figures from a paper researching specifically the effects of copper and zinc. And so the diatoms in each like group of species on the left is like the normal shape. And then the ones that are affected by the copper and zinc waste. And so you can see some of these get really funky. Um, this does happen in like a regular diatom population, but at much lower levels. And so seeing a really high number of these malformed diatoms is an indication of something going wrong. There's some sort of toxic uh, metal or something else going on in the environment. There's also more locally contamination from mining waste in general is a really big subject as well as looking at remediation of these uh, ecosystems. This is actually uh, taken from an exercise we do with our intro students in one of our labs, but looking at, this is in Montana, mine tailings. So what did the ecosystem look like before the mine tailings and the contamination? What does it look like at the mine tailings? Is there anything still there? And then has it recovered downstream? And so this one's pretty clear. They're not doing so hot at the mine tailings. You can actually see there are like this one species of diatom that seems to be doing okay. It doesn't have as much silica, which can be a sign of stress or it's just that species doesn't make as much silica. But the other thing, if you look closely, is that the species that have come back are not what we would expect that is abundant above the mine tailing. So those are basically dying out down the river, but something else is able to come back at least. The other thing that's really neat that I wish I knew more about, but I don't, is reconstructing past environments. And so this is something where we can look back to before humans were present or in past ecosystems that we didn't study at the time. And we can go take these sediment cores out of the lake, which is essentially this really long tube of dirt. And they can take these sediment cores and date them based on how much sediment has sunk to the bottom of the lake and look at these different layers, put a year on it, and then look at what's in those sediment cores. So this is something that's done with pollen as well. Um, but diatoms, because they preserve really well, because they're silica, we can use that to understand what's going on 100 years ago, 200 years ago, thousands of years ago. Um, so this is one example where they were looking at like lake temperature, ambient air temperature, what was going on before we were here to monitor those lakes, as well as understanding how glacial meltwaters, um, like locally here, Glacier National Park, how those glacial meltwaters started to affect the environment when they first started melting versus what's happening now and what could happen in the future. Um, I want to give a shout out to Brooke Bannerman, who's another student here. She is doing this specifically with St. Mary Lake and Lake McDonald and Glacier National Park to help develop essentially what will be like a monitoring program. So they don't have something right now because the federal funding is not there. But using these sediment cores and tracking the diatom species that are present and how that's changed over time, they can use that to now look into the future and see what's happening in the lake. Is it changing? Is it doing okay. And this is very exciting, uh, exciting work. Um, the other, I want to highlight one specific species because it comes up more uh, visibly 
LSA. So it's actually native to Montana. It's Didymos Phenia geminata or Didymo, uh, sometimes called rock snot. It's native to Montana. It doesn't really cause issues here often. There are sometimes what's called a nuisance bloom, which is kind of you think of like an invasive species going crazy. It's like that, but it's not something that's invasive. It was just here already. And so we get these nuisance blooms. These are stock forming diatoms and they form these long goopy stalks and they clog up lots of waterways. And a while back, it was introduced to New Zealand, unfortunately, where it has really taken over and it's this huge issue. And think about like, we try to protect our waters from mussels and invasive species. It's a lot, you go like clean it, make sure it's all there. But trying to keep these individual cells out of the water where one gets in and then you get, this is literally a report. This is basically all Didymo. It covers the riverbed by up to eight inches thick of these cells. And so it clogs dams, it clogs boats, like everything you can think of is getting in there. And so there is some research that's starting to suggest nuisance blooms might become a more uh, bigger problem here with climate change, differences in temperature, differences in nutrients in the waterways. But it's not very clear, but it's like the one to think to see. Um, it's also very pretty looking otherwise, if you don't think about all the negative effects it has. It's really big, it's really easy to see. Um, and they just cruise around, they look really happy. I didn't know what terrible stuff they caused. The other thing that's really important locally, and this is tied to what I research, is Cladophora and Epithemia and the relationship between these two species. And so you might be familiar in the Clark Fork River, where in the summer you start to see these really long green streamers forming, and then they start to turn this brown, this rusty red color and get brown. It's actually not the Cladophora dying. It is the Cladophora getting coated in these diatoms, like completely coated. It's a little harder to see than I had hoped in here, but you can see kind of at a further zoomed out scale what that looks like where you have these strands and the diatoms are starting to cover it and looks brown. But if we look at this like SEM level, electron microscope level scale, you can see what I mean by coating. And so one of the species that is doing that is this Epithemia sorex. There are lots of these species. Uh, we're working to understand what species there are, what they're doing, where they're at. Epithemia sorax is one of the most abundant here in Montana, and it's found in every single river basin in Montana at like appreciable levels too. And then like late August, it's like 80, 90% of the diatoms that are there. And so diatoms in this family that includes epithemia, Ripplodiaceae, has these symbionts. And so they were in that picture. I don't know where it went, but the Apithemia sorex had these spherical things. They're called spherid bodies in all of these different diatom species. And these used to be cyanobacteria. So they used to be the blue green algae that you think of, but they've lost the ability to photosynthesize. All they do is provide nitrogen for their hosts. And so this is really important in streams that are unlimited. They don't have lots of nitrogen. They have lots of phosphorus, which is stuff like the Clark Fork River here. Um, and I'm really interested in just understanding like how that works. How do you get a cell? <laughs> Gotta stop stepping on the wire. <laughs> how do you get into a cell? How do you learn to work with that other individual cell kind of at these like really intricate genetic metabolic levels? There it is. Okay, uh, so this is that sorex I showed you earlier. There's these two spheres. Those are the spheroid bodies. And not only are they really present here in Montana, they're like everywhere. And this is like really understudied. And when I first started working on this project, it was like hard to find people that are studying this system and everything. But if you look at their presence, um, this is a more recent study that looked based on genetic data from the environment just in the oceans to find where they are. And these green uh, squares and triangles are things that we've collected from my project. But also there are diatoms on iNaturalist if you are active in that community at all. Some people do upload diatoms and other microscopy stuff. And so this actually kind of just looks like population density <laughs> where people are. And they really just seem to be all over the world. And so they might be this like really important source of nitrogen 
into the ecosystems that we just hadn't seen before. Um, and then I cannot give a talk about diatoms without talking about uh, Dr. Lauren Balls, who is like the diatom Montana guy. Like he has done so much work uh, throughout his career. He's retired now and he is publishing the, the first volume and there's a second volume coming up soon or maybe out now. Um, and it is by far the largest image catalog, like by miles, the largest image catalog we have of diatoms in the US and the continent, but it's just for the continental US and a little bit of Canada and Alaska and this like Northwestern area. So these are all of the sample sites that he's included in these books. Like this is so much, I like cannot, it's so much work. It's amazing. And the fact that it's all compiled together is just useful for anybody who's doing these sediment reconstructions, who's looking at environmental quality indicators, who's interested in where species are at all, if they're trying to find new ones to sample. So I just have to like give them a huge shout out. Um, and then the last thing I want to shout out is the Montana diatom collection. So this is a part of University of Montana's herbarium, and it takes up about two shelves worth of space. But in each of these boxes, I have one here that's a little larger than normal, but these boxes hold 100 slides per box. They're like the size of a composition notebook, but a couple stacked. And it actually results in over 16,000 prepared slides. And so this is a massive amount. Think of like 16,000 plant herbarium samples is huge, right? And not only do we have these 16,000 slides and this other prepared material, these hold information not only about like individual species, but like species abundance and what different species are all in one location. So these slides hold multiple species information about these different places in time. And it also includes what I've got today is over 110 type species. And so this is literally like what the diatom species was described based on is like this slide. This is where we named the species. This is what it's based on. So that if people are trying to identify theirs, they can go back to this record and understand uh, what their species is. Is it the same? Is it different, et cetera? Um, and these are a couple photos from the Montana diatom collection. This is Simula genitii. I don't think I've ever said that out loud. But it's a diatom that was described from here in Montana. It's pretty native to like this Northwest region of the US. And then another slide showing this like diversity of species that you can see. Um, and then the last thing I wanna shout out is if you wanna know more about diatoms at all, or you just wanna look at some pretty pictures of diatoms, diatoms.org is for diatoms in North America. It is like the, it's a well put together website, first of all, which is great for a database, um, but it's got so much information on if you're interested in learning more about diatoms, if you're interested in like actually getting into microscopy or taxonomy or learning more about these things, learning where these different gene, like different diatoms are. It's just like the most beautiful uh, resource I could ever recommend. A lot of the photos I put in this presentation today are from this website. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, these are, if you want to like reach out to me, talk later, uh, have my stuff on there. Has the, di has the Montana diatom slide collection been scanned? No, this is part of what I would really like to do in what little free time I have is help uh, Giovanna, who's a new curator, um, work on digitizing, like understanding what we have in the collection, because right now it's literally just the physical slides and there's not a public record available. Any other questions? I also have a microscope up here for anybody in person. If anybody wants to come check out some diatoms, we can turn it on at the end. Yeah. They range anywhere from like four or five microns. So like just a little bigger than a bacterial cell to like 500 microns, which is half a millimeter, which is like almost visible with the naked eye if you've got very sharp eyes. Um, so they have got this huge range of size, like thickness of frustral and everything. Yeah. So, 
conception of the cilia, which they seem sort of like bacteria to me. Like in what kind of reproduce? So they don't have a nucleus. They do have a nucleus. Yeah. Even. Okay, I'm going to do the classic. Uh, that's it. This one. Uh, this is actually the nucleus right here. Uh, so you can see, so they've got a nucleus, they've got chloroplasts, they've got mitochondria. Let's see if we can get a good shot of it. So they've got all the all the organelles, classic organelles you would think of. Uh, yeah. Any other? How do they move? So this is not well understood, actually. Um, we know that the wraith is involved. That uh, slit in the frustule is involved, and it's has something to do with excreting like a mucus to glide along but how that works other than that is actually not super well understood which is interesting two questions uh, uh great question i have no idea oh yeah so the question was <laughs> the question is how did they how did didymo how did didymo get to new zealand um my guess is on accident on a boat or on somebody's boot, like something. Or the other thing is like somebody imports a plant for their aquarium and it gets into their aquarium. Yeah, yeah. It's, I don't know when Didymo got to New Zealand. I know it was more recent, but the, I don't know how much of the attention was paid. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much attention was paid to like something that small to get to New Zealand, but yeah, something just got through the cracks. Yeah. Yeah. So they're most, you said they're much more common. Centric diatoms are a lot of the research for diatoms is they are, is marine diatoms. Zooplankton, so little little things, the things that whales eat, that stuff eats the diatoms. Um, but like fish, any sort of filter feeder will eat diatoms. Yeah. I mean, they must, yeah. I know, so it makes them harder to eat. So there's a lot of research that looks at like how much silica they have, like how thick that cell wall is and how preferentially they're eaten so it might be you have less silica you're going to be eaten first but eventually if something is hungry enough they'll still eat it doesn't seem like fish would be able to say well, i want that one but i don't want that one. yeah so in that case so if it's something as big as a fish they're probably just eating it all they don't like it. the the level of glass for a fish is not as intense for the level of glass like a copepod or an amph like something like almost microscopic then it's like they can pick and choose because they're able to like work at that scale. Um, can diatoms go dormant and live outside water for a while and then become active again when rehydrated? Some of them can, yes. So some diatoms do live in places that dry out periodically. And there's like a little bit of research done. A lot of diatom stuff is not super well understood, um, especially they're like, just biology, how they're existing. Um, but some diatoms can form these like hyper solicified, super, super thick cell walls that they kind of condense into when they sink into the soils for the winter or when something goes dry. And those can like re uh, grow. I don't know if they divide to get out of that state, but yeah, there are some species that can just live out in the dry. They just, they go dormant. And eventually, when there's water, they'll grow again. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh.
Thank you. I've, I've accomplished my goal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>